The gospel this morning is taken from the book of Mark, first chapter, verses 12 to 13 and verse 35. Mark 1, verses 12 to 13. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. This morning's service sermon is sifting through the noise, seeking peace in a chaotic world. And our guest speaker this morning is Cameron Hackett. And we are so happy to have him with us. Cameron Hackett is a bivocational minister working in both the financial sector as a wealth manager and financial advisor, and preaching and teaching at conferences and churches in the greater Bay Area, while providing spiritual direction for young pastors starting new ministries. He loves to hike in Wild Canyon, Wild Cat Canyon with his wife, Irma Erna, and their two dogs, Ella and Clara. Welcome, Pastor Hackett. <laughs> Good morning. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you all. I bring greetings from Oak Life Church in Oakland, California, where I am most mornings. And um, thank you for the introduction. I'm a bivocational minister. So my day job is uh, doing finance. And then I s work with the Presbytery of San Francisco doing pulpit supply and also work with their commission lay pastor program. And it's an honor and joy to be with you this morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. We're all here. We're awake. <laughs> Uh, all right, today's sermon is sifting through the noise, seeking peace in a chaotic world. I don't know about you, but for some reason, this particular season feels busy, feels busy to me. I don't know if it's post Easter or it's the rain is calming down and all the plans everyone stopped having are now like rising back up and coming to the forefront, but it feels like a particularly busy uh, season. And um, when we think about this topic, we think about spiritual disciplines or what I like to call spiritual practices. And the ones that I've been thinking about lately all start with S's. So bear with me. Silence, stillness, solitude, simplicity, Sabbath, spaciousness, and surrender. So this morning, I want to look at these passages and uh, maybe do a little bit of group exegesis. I think there's something kind of powerful with the, when the congregation does the preaching and they, uh, what, what do they see in the scriptures? So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read the passages one more time. And then I'm actually going to ask you if there's something that stands out to you about these passages. So get your courage up to speak and uh, say something this morning. So Mark 1, 12 through 13, at once the Spirit sent him, Jesus, out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended to him. And then Mark 1, 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he would pray. Congregation. Let the Spirit speak to you. Anything stand out to you about these two passages? You can yell it out. It could be a word or a phrase. Anything that's interesting to you. Obedience. Obedience. At once. At once. Yes. Love it. Other things. Alone time with God. Absolutely. Maybe one more, one last thought. 
It's on the tip of someone's tongue. Yes. Very early in the morning, in the quiet of the morning. Great observations. We're going to talk about all those things. Thank you. The way that I would summarize it this morning and what I want to talk to you about is this, and this is what I'm going to try to talk to us about. Jesus himself attends to his inner world, and he invites us to do the same. Jesus himself attends to his inner world, and he invites us to do the same. All right, this particular photo that's on the next slide reminds me of one attempt I made to attend to my inner world. A little bit of my background. I graduated college in 2004, 20 years ago. I, may, I don't know if that makes me old or young. I, I haven't decided yet. Um, feeling a little old with the 20-year uh, college an, uh, anniversary coming up. And um, upon graduation, I was very excited to be a minister, which was unexpected because I went to a very secular college. No one, not very many other people were excited, but I was got really excited about Jesus. I came from a non-religious family. So this was kind of like my way of rebelling against my family was I'm going to be religious. I'm going to get excited about Jesus. I did the reverse Uno card on my family. And so I got involved in a college campus ministry, and for 10 years straight, I did everything I could to be extremely busy with ministry. I was a college minister, I was a youth pastor, and for 10 years straight, I did everything I could to be extremely productive and extremely busy, all for Jesus, all for ministry. And then about 10 years in, in 2014, I got tired. I got really tired. I mean, the kind of tired where laying in bed doesn't fix it. Netflix doesn't fix it. A spa day does not fix it. A new hobby does not fix it. I was tired, soul tired. And there was a deep disconnect between my inner world and my outer world. You ever had that happen to you? You could say in those days, I was not attending to my inner world. I was actually doing the things that Christian pastors are supposed to be doing. I was doing prayer retreats and Sabbaths, but all of it was just so I could be successful in ministry. There was something very false about it. And I got away with that for a very long time. But then it caught up with me, and I realized I deeply needed some of these S's, these silence, stillness, solitude, Sabbath, and eventually surrender. So after 10 years of full-time ministry, I handed in my resignation to my church, and I got in a car by myself, and I drove to this cabin, and I spent 10 days in silence, which was the beginning of a four-month sabbatical. And I've thought a lot about that moment, which was actually 10 years ago, this past February, because it ended up being a really significant moment in my spiritual life, a turning point in my spiritual life, though I did not know it at the time. We'll come back to that. So this morning, I think it's worth considering how does Jesus attend to his inner life and the context of those events. And so I want to look at these two stories and talk about them. And the first thing I will say is that um, Jesus attends to his inner life despite being extremely busy. You with me so far? So in, God, in Mark's gospel, we read um, Mark 135. Very early in the morning while it was dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So that's 35 verses into Mark 1. So that's just the first chapter. But what happens in the 34 verses before? Let me just remind you. I know I, I sense in my heart that there are Bible scholars in this room. So just a reminder of what happens in verses 1 through 34 in Mark. 
All right, ready. Jesus is in the wilderness with John. He gets baptized. The Holy Spirit arrives like a dove. The Spirit sends him out into the wilderness. Jesus is tempted with the wild animals. He's attended to by angels. John gets sent to prison. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus starts calling disciples. Simon, Andrew, James, John, come and follow me, he says. Leave your nets. Jesus goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, drives out an impure spirit. Be quiet, he says to it. People are amazed. Jesus goes to Simon's house, heals his mother-in-law. Then they have an all-night healing session, healing sesh, I think is what Jesus calls it. And that's all before verse 35. See, I think if anyone had a good reason not to attend to their inner life, it would be Jesus. He's incredibly busy. He's a leader. He's successful. Jesus is batting a thousand with his healing. Just can't miss. He's an influencer. He's, Jesus is an influencer. He has followers. He has tons of demands on his time. And yet we find that he is very intentional with solitude, with silence, and potentially, I think, a lot more. Now, as I look at this passage, I will confess to you um, that I'm the kind of person who reads something like this, and I have an internal monologue that's kind of harsh, kind of pumps me up. And when I read a passage like this, I think, Cam, you got to pray more. You, you need to wake up early. You need to get up earlier. You need to, you know, anybody have an internal dialogue that's kind of harsh on them? I, I have a very mean inner dialogue sometimes. You got, you got to pray more. You got to get up earlier. You got to find more silent places. I definitely used to approach the scripture like this. Let me do it really well. Let me do it just like Jesus did. And let me be successful in applying this uh, scripture. And don't get me wrong, prayer is good. Waking up early is good. Silence? Silence is beautiful sometimes. But I prefer the phrase attending to your inner life because I think prayer is just one of the things that happens as we attend to our inner life. I think prayer is, or attending to our inner life is broader than prayer. Or put another way, Prayer is broader than just talking to God and listening to God. I think it's important just for us to acknowledge that we are in the realm of metaphor, right? We're in the realm of metaphor. Think about it this way. When the disciples come and find Jesus on that morning, the Spiritual things that are happening are invisible, right? Yes, there are moments in the Bible, right? Pentecost, there's the fire, right? Or the dove comes down at Jesus' baptism where the invisible is made visible. But this is just like a Tuesday and Jesus is just sitting there, right? We're talking about metaphor. And yet I think something is happening. Something quite profound is happening. So I want to share, there are many metaphors that we talk about when we talk about attending to our inner world. And I just want to share one, and it's the metaphor of the forest. So I think our inner world is, or our interiority is a little bit like a forest. And our soul is a little bit like a forest dwelling animal. And as we get quiet, as we experiment with stillness and with silence, there are things that emerge, maybe that we didn't even know were there. I really like how one author named Parker Palmer, he's a Quaker author, puts it. And there's a slide here. Let me read this for us. This is the metaphor that I really enjoy. Soul is like a wild animal, tough, resilient, savvy, self-sufficient, and yet exceedingly shy. If we want to see a wild animal, the last thing we should do is to go crashing through the woods, shouting for the creature to come out. 
But if we were willing to walk quietly in the woods and sit silently, the creature we are waiting for may well emerge. That was certainly my experience at the cabin. I realized that I actually love the noise of busyness because it protects me from asking all kinds of questions that maybe make me nervous or uncomfortable. But then in the silence, all of a sudden my soul's like, hey, hey, I wanna talk to you. I have things to say. So what happens in our inner worlds as we make room for this silence, as we make room for this forest-dwelling animal to emerge? I think the second scripture helps us think about that. What happens when the noise of life's business fades and we lean into these practices? The story of Jesus in the wilderness is a great story for that kind of thing. Mark 1, 12 through 13 says, At once the Spirit sent him, Jesus, out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended to him. Just two quick observations about this text. The first is, it's a Spirit-led endeavor, right? The Spirit leads him out. And the second is, I don't think we need to get obsessed with the particular amount of time, 40 days, whether it's a true 40 days or symbolic. The point is, it's an extended amount of time. There's something about a longer amount of time where this work needs to happen. So what happens in the desert? Well, I have a sense that Bible scholars will remember Matthew's gospel and the very, very famous passage of the three temptations. If I could ask you to recall that for a moment, because I think that that story helps us think about what happens when we attend to our inner worlds. I think in those interactions, Jesus is wrestling with two important and interrelated topics, identity and vocation. Identity and vocation. That, I think, is at the heart of what Jesus and Satan are wrestling with, identity and vocation. Think about those stories. Satan says, tell these rocks to become stones. That's a vocational question. If you are the son of God, Jesus gets asked. That's an identity question. Bow down and worship me and I will give you the kingdoms of the world. That's a vocational and an identity question. I think when we hear the word Satan, it, it kind of is a little weird or it freaks us out, but it just means adversary, accuser, right? That's what Jesus is wrestling with, and those are the things that get illustrated. Identity and vocation. All you have to do is think about the first story, right? Jesus is praying early in the morning. His disciples come and find him. They say, oh, Jesus, last night was awesome. You did all that healing. Let's go back to town. We'll get people lined up. We'll charge them a nickel. We'll, you can keep healing people. Right? That's their agenda. Jesus says, no. No. No vocational clarity immediately follows attending to his inner life. You with me on that? Vocational clarity immediately follows attending to his inner life. The two are integrally connected. I think it's inevitable as that we le if we lean into these practices, that issues of identity and vocation will arise for us. And I think that's part of the reason why we often don't, because that's scary. It certainly was for me and it has been for me. It was scary for me to be at that cabin and to begin to ask deeper questions about my life. Who am I? What am I called to do? Have I lost my way? Does that explain why I'm so tired? Because I'm trying on other people's faces? because I have a true self that I'm not listening to. 
I'll tell you what happened for me. And this is just my story. It's very niche, but what started in that cabin for me was realizing that I had kind of fallen for a false dream. My false dream was um, what I call the American evangelical hero pastor dream. I thought God would, if I was obedient and gifted enough, that he would make me prominent, maybe semi-famous. I would be really influential. I'd be writing books. I'd have my name.com as a website. And all of that would have me feeling very, very successful with God and with people. And almost all of my religious life, though I tried to hide it, was aimed in that direction. Now, it sounds funny, and, and I can laugh or cry um, thinking about it now because I have a little bit of distance, but it was terrifying for me to ask those questions because it was the way that I was making sense of my life. It was my guiding principle, and it was false. It was false. It wasn't God's voice. It wasn't even my own voice. It was me trying on different masks of the world even Christian masks. It's taken me many years to identify those things, but the fruit of them began at that cabin, attending to my inner life. And that's my invitation for us. That being said, I'm still to this day deeply resistant. There's part of me that deeply resists being still, being silent. I love being productive. I love making lists and crossing things off, and making some influence in the world. And just returning to the metaphor, it doesn't always feel productive to sit in the forest of our interiority and wait for a forest-dwelling animal that is our soul to emerge. And yet, if we never do that, we end up living life that is disconnected from our true self and vocation. Let me end with one resource and one challenge. The resource that I'll offer to you is a book called Let Your Life Speak by Parker Palmer. It's one of my favorite books. I read it each year. It's been deeply helpful to me uh, to think about vocation and identity. I commend it to you. He's a Quaker author and a teacher. If you want to take a look at it afterwards. I'll give you a copy to sort of poke your head at. So here's my three-part inner life challenge. Now, if you're a mystic, if you're a prayer warrior, which I sense some of you probably are, this probably is something that you're already doing, but just in case you need a little encouragement, in the next week, pick one morning to wake up early and be with God. In the next month, try to dabble in the Sabbath. Turn your phone all the way off, put it away. Cease from all electronic communication for a day and rest and see what happens. And then lastly, in the next year, see if you can create space that's broader, that's longer, and see what kinds of thing emerge as you create a, a longer type of sabbatical moment for you and God. That's my encouragement this morning.